So uh, I'm a principal investigator here at OSCR. I started my lab about five years ago, a little bit less, and my team is basically looking at using omic technologies to develop biomarkers that predict how we should treat different patients. And in some sense, we use any omic technology, really any large data set that we can get our hands on. And we're going to spend today talking about microarrays. Microarrays are a really good technology to talk about because they're probably the only omics technology where we actually sort of know what we're doing. I mean, it's fair to say, and you've seen the rest of the course, that there's a lot of unclarity, lack of clarity, imprecision, about how you might analyze different types of data. In microarrays, there are some clear things that we can say are right and are wrong, some things that we know work well and some things that we don't. There's obviously still opportunities to improve the way we do our analysis, but it's reasonably worked out. The other part of it is that as we've gone forward, we've started to understand general principles of how you would analyze large-scale genomic data from microarrays that are now being transferred to all of the other types of data. So it's kind of led the, the standardization that's being seen for other types of information. So it's a good way to end off, or almost end off the course, is by seeing just where all the other omic data types are ultimately going to get to. Obviously, all the slides will be available to you, and you can uh, use them as you wish under a Creative Commons license. And we're going to talk about gene expression profiling. So we're going to talk about gene expression microarrays. We'll spend the first, uh, what is that, two hours and 15 minutes or two, on, two hours straight uh, talking about what microarrays are like, how we pre-process them, what are the characteristics of the data. Then we'll spend the last hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half after a coffee break looking through how you analyze a microarray experiment. And unlike sequencing, you can trivially download a microarray experiment to your computer and work with it. That's one of the nice things about it. And during my PhD, I analyzed most of the major experiments on planes while traveling to conferences. So it's something that becomes much more viable and easier to do while you're on the road. So the things that I want you to take away, and you forget just about everything that I talk about, these are the key things. Number one, understanding the different types of microarrays. There's several. Number two, understanding where the noise comes in the experiment. If you know where there is noise, then you can figure out at least whether your experiment looks good or does not. Appreciate the entire pipeline. What are the steps involved in an analysis? So that when you read a paper, you know, is a key step missing? Have they forgotten something entirely important? Or have they not given us the information I need to interpret what was done? And then in the practical side, we'll start working on how you can input the raw data into our bioconductor, how you can pre-process it, and maybe how you can get into the standard statistical analyses. That last question, some people will get to, some people won't, depending on the timing of the, uh, um, how far people get during the study area. But uh, we give full answers so you can sort of see template code that goes through those types of analyses. So you'll discover I ask a lot of questions. You guys are going to have to stay awake. Uh, and let me start off with one. Microarrays are really old. So the first version of them is 1995, so almost 20 years ago. So what do they measure? What, what is an expression microarray, a standard affymetrics or Agilent array measure? Hybridization signal. Anybody want to be more, anybody want to tweak that answer? Intensity of probes. Okay. I'm sorry, mRNA levels. I saw one more hand at the back. Okay. So we got hybridization, intensity levels, uh, intensity, and mRNA levels. So there's a couple of things to comment on there. One is that they only capture steady state mRNA abundances. We will often often, like I did on the slide, call them expression arrays. It's a terrible term. They're not really measuring expression, they're measuring abundance. They're measuring an absolute level. In fact, they generate a signal intensity that is proportional to the absolute level. So in fact, we don't even get a particularly good estimate between genes of which genes are more expressed and which genes are less expressed. Instead, what we find out for an individual gene is an ordering. That's essentially what they're telling us the order of samples for individual genes. And we do that for every gene in the genome, and therefore we have the ability to learn quite a bit. So we're going to start off talking about what are these fundamentally. We'll talk a little bit about the technologies um, and a lot about how they're analyzed and what are the key steps that are common to all of the technologies.
And then we'll zoom into one particular technique, affimetrics arrays, which are probably the most widely, well, which are the most widely used today, uh, and take a look at some of the details of how they're analyzed before looking at that in practice in the, the practical. So here's a kind of good definition of a microarray. I say kind of good. This is the Wikipedia definition. It's a multiplex technology containing of thousands of oligonucleotide spots, each containing moles of a specific DNA sequence. It's not actually a bad definition. It's a little bland, but I think the key point there is that it's multiplex. A microarray is a way of measuring a lot of things in parallel. And therefore, that has two consequences. One is that the errors that you would observe on each of those things will be correlated with one another because they're measured at the same time. And the second is that you can generate very large amounts of data. Those large amounts of data will allow you to be able to do statistical and other types of analyses in ways that would be impossible. The whole point of them is to allow you to quantitate something. So in a way, the whole goal of a micro is to allow you to measure how much of something you have how much RNA you have, how much DNA you have. DNA applications can be specific to specific sequences. So you can say, oh, here's how much of allele A versus allele B, a genotyping array. Or here's how much I have of one region of the chromosome versus another, copy number arrays. And so that means that there's a wide variety of applications. Anything you can imagine measuring about DNA or RNA can be measured using a microarray. So, Fundamentally, it's a flexible technology that we shouldn't think, oh, microarrays only measure DNA, or they only measure RNA, or they only measure RNA abundances. You can measure splice variants, genotypes, pretty much whatever you think of. And in general, although not exclusively, we don't use microarrays as a technique to verify hypotheses, although there are clear exceptions to that. Instead, we usually use them to generate new ideas, new questions. So they're kind of a screening technique. They highlight specific features or genes that are of key interest to investigate further. There are obvious exceptions, like my whole research program is around biomarker discovery, which is a hypothesis-driven experiment, not a, a hypothesis-generating, uh, and pathway analysis and, and things of that nature. Uh, and because they're hypothesis-generating, there's often an idea that, therefore, I don't need to worry about experimental design. Actually, the fact that we typically can't afford to do as many experiments as we need for statistical power, and you'll talk about statistics in more detail this afternoon, uh, makes it very important that you actually design these experiments correctly. And we'll talk about this a little bit uh, in about 45 minutes, about some of the key principles of designing a micro-experiment. But suffice it to say that a poorly designed micro-experiment is orders of magnitude harder to, uh, to analyze than a well-designed one. So you can save yourself months of time by simply thinking through your experimental design properly. So, the fundamental nature of an array. We start off with some sort of a sample. Typically, we're going to have a couple of samples. We might have samples across a clinical range, different types of diseases, or different patients with different outcomes. And we're going to extract DNA or RNA to put them onto the microarray. That sounds simple. This is actually one of the major challenges, is that it's difficult to get your samples to really look similar. What happens if some of your samples are a precious tumor type, something very rare, and as a control, you say, oh, well, we can go and get benign versions of that tissue from patients who are coming into the hospital right now. And you're comparing a control group, which is fresh, unfrozen samples, to a treatment group, which is formalin, fixed, archival tissues that have been sitting in a hospital in air places for 40 years. And now you say, oh, I expect that there are no technical differences. Well, it turns out that you can trivially detect the RNA and DNA differences in those types of samples. The sample preparation has as big or bigger an effect on all of your data than anything about hydrogen bioinformatics. So your upfront design to make sure that your samples are similar and consistent is critical. Similarly, it's not just your sample, it's how you do your extraction. If you do a poly A versus a total uh, RNA prep, completely different, completely different uh, biases and sources of error. And if you give me the same samples processed with both protocols, you could pick them out clear as day as two separate groups because they have systematic biases. And there's nothing wrong with those systematic biases as long as we know they're there and we can control them. But it means that from the earliest step, we have to be thinking about the samples and what are the characteristics of them so that we can incorporate that into our pre-processing and our statistical models.
let's, let's conceptualize now that we've got a great sample. And we're going to put that sample in a microarray. And here you've got your simple one spot microarray, simplest possible thing that we can have. We've got some terminology. The glass substrate on which the microarray sits is called the chip. The actual group of spots, a group of uh, DNA molecules, all of which are identical, are called the feature. And the individual DNA molecules are called the probes. This sounds stupid, but in practice, this took something like six years before the field standardized on this, and it led to huge confusion. So we've got the probe that's on the chip, and we've got a series of high-quality DNA or RNA that we extracted. And from now on, I'm just going to say RNA to make life simple. Well, the first thing that we're going to want to do is label it to another color, and we call this the target DNA. The target is your sample, the probe is the is the chip itself. We're going to hybridize it onto the chip. That allows there to be standard Watson and Crick base pairing, and that creates some sort of an affinity between complementary uh, bases. This is the whole basis of how microarrays work by that Watson and Crick base pairing. And at the next step, we're going to have all sorts of non-specific hybridization, kind of noise, and we wash that away. And this is basically stringent enough washing conditions that will remove non-specific hybridization but keep the one that we really want. Now, this makes microarrays super flexible because we can do things very cleverly. We can wash so stringently that only perfect matches remain. Right, we can do genotyping now. Or we can relax the washing so we can allow there to be certain mismatches, which is really good if we have uh, samples from a different species that we don't know very well. Ultimately, we're going to take a look at each individual spot and scan it. And these, these uh, target DNA is fluorescently labeled, so by scanning it we can simply see how much light is emitted, and that will give us a measure for how much signal is at that spot. So what we're doing is we're detecting a fluorescent signal that is proportional to the amount of hybridization at that individual feature. Obviously, a microarray doesn't contain one spot. It contains a series of spots. And for many microarrays, we don't use just a single color. Instead, we're going to start off with an individual. We're going to say teeth or liver. And we're going to have one labeled with one dye, a red dye, and another labeled with a green dye. This allows us to have two identical samples that only differ by their fluorophore labeling. We would mix those together and put them on a microarray. This is called a homotypic hybridization. It's a very important quality control metric. Essentially, what you expect here is equal signal intensities at each spot. So you can see here, you have two reds and two greens. One red, one green. Those are cases where you saw, as expected, no bias from sample to sample. In other cases, one, one, or this two and one, you see differences. That's an estimate of the noise of your microarray. About half or 60% of microarrays use a single die. Those are primarily affymetrics and nimble arrays, And about 40% to 50% use two. Those would be things like Agilent arrays. Uh, and both technologies are perfectly viable. With two color arrays, you have the advantage of being able to do this additional quality control check, where you can take a look at homotypic error rates, which is very, very useful. On the other hand, having two dyes is inherently bringing in additional noise and complexity. Single color arrays are sometimes thought to be more simple. Now let's stay along the two-color array design. Now we can introduce a second individual. We're going to treat them differently, one with a drug, the other one not. We're going to, again, extract some sort of DNA or RNA from them, mix it in a tube, and hybridize it. And this allows us to get good estimates of the levels of the abundances of each gene in a relative way. So microarrays don't really do absolute abundance. They do relative abundance, and it'll say, in group A, the animal on the left versus the animal on the right, this is the ratio. There is more of this in the animal on the left, and there is more of this in the animal on the right. So it provides a relative assessment of their abundances. I mentioned that microarrays allow nonspecific hybridization. That's really important because, for example, that's how we can do cross-species studies. So almost every important cross-species study was done using a microarray for the last 20 years. Why? Because we can take a human array and we can hybridize a chimp. But you can hybridize a chimp or a 
bonobo or other primates to a, a human array and get very, very good signal. Similarly, we can do the same thing for plants. And so the vast majority of agricultural research has used that. Uh, there was not sufficient laughing, which means not enough people recognize what that plant is. Um, so you can put uh, uh, many different uh, agricultural species onto arrays that are related to one another. There's obviously still air arrays, but this allows people who are researching one type of orange to study all citrus fruits simultaneously. That's a lot cheaper, and the cost envelope of an array is $150. The cost envelope of a sequencing experiment is $1,500. So you have a lot of price differential, and that's why a lot of model organism studies have continued to happen in microarrays, and probably will for the next several years. Showing you are spotted arrays. So spotted arrays are produced by a robot. You're actually seeing the robot right here. And the way this works is the robot has a series of pins, just basically on a head like that. And the robot is going to go to a 96 well plate or 3D4 well plate and go and it'll just dip these pins into the plate. That alone is enough to suck a tiny bit of the liquid up onto the pins, and then it's going to go to a glass slide, and it's going to touch the glass slide, and a tiny bit of liquid that was on the pins is going to drop onto the glass slide. Contact deposition. That sounds like an incredibly strange way to make a, uh, a, a microarray. Well, that was the first way that microarrays were ever made. It came from Pat Brown's lab. Um, in Stanford, and basically they were thinking about robotic ways of analyzing yeast better. And this is what they initially thought of. And one of the reasons why this type of array was so common is that they made all of their uh, designs for the robot publicly available on what was like then a very lightly used internet that was basically only for universities. So somebody would go and say, huh, here is the science paper showing the first high throughput expression profiling of an organism, yeast, and I want to do that. And they made their schematics for how to do this available, so I'm going to point my machine shop to it, and my machine shop is going to go and make a robot. And literally thousands of microarray printing robots were built in that way, using the schematics that they would put online. You can really easily recognize a two-color array, uh, a spotted array. They're, they're trivial to see when you look at the data. First, they're two colors, so you can immediately see here that there's a mix of red over there, green, and lots of yellow. Yellow because red and green are in equal quantities. So if you've got red and green equally, they average out to give you yellow. Uh, you've got some red spots and some green spots. That's one. The other reason is because they're happening in these 384 well plate batches, you will very, very clearly see grids. Each grid corresponds to one 384 well plate. And they'd have multiple on this little array, they've got four. So as soon as you see that pattern, you know the technology that was used to produce the array. You should also almost immediately be able to guess at some of the characteristics that are bad about this. So you'd say, huh, well, what happens over time as the pins wear out? What happens if one of the pins gets bent in a little direction? What happens as I'm continually doing this, and what happens if my sample starts to dry out a little bit? So the concentration of DNA increases over time because you have a dry out of the sample in each of those 384 wells, which are kind of small. Those sorts of things are extremely common, and they lead to systematic artifacts across experiments. As a result, and for uh, uh, almost 10 years, there was an influx of work to develop new technologies for microarrays. We'll talk about a couple of these. There are inkjet arrays, uh, photolithographically generated arrays, and bead arrays, which are still all in reasonably wide use. There have also been, for uh, probably the last 15 years, routine publications talking high-quality protein microarrays, cell arrays, or lipid arrays. Uh, and as I like to say, protein arrays are redeveloped in a nature paper to market because the technology is very, very difficult. Uh, it's hard to get antibodies that are going to be robust, shippable around the world, uh, that can stay in conjugated form like that. It's hard to do this in high throughput very cheaply, and the net effect of it is that there's not really any useful protein arrays on the market. TCGA uses a, I think it's 184 protein array for a lot of their studies. It's not useless, but it's 184 proteins out of the 20,000 plus all the post-translational modifications. So it's a very limited assessment compared to what we do with typical uh, genomic studies. So we're going to go over each of these in a bit of detail. 
And we'll start off with Ninja Race. You guys are a pretty quiet class so far. No questions? Oh, see, that's what I needed to do. Uh, Julie first, then searching. Sorry. Uh, Well, oh, no, that was the human part was mostly a joke. It would be a plant on a planter, right? Yeah, so making custom arrays turns out to be reasonably hard. Um, here's why. Imagine that we take the, the second or third most important agricultural crop. So first is certainly corn, second is certainly rice. So the third most important is cotton. So, cotton just got sequenced. Like, the genome of cotton was reported, I think, a week ago. That's a big problem. If you want to design an array, you need to know what the genes are. And we're talking about, like, you know, all of our clothing. We all have large amounts of cotton that is a billion-dollar industry, and the genome just got sequenced. So it's a long time before people studying uh, many other industries, many types of grapes, fruit, etc., will have good genome sequences to build an array off of. The second thing is that even once you have that, building the array isn't cheap, and you need to be willing to or planning to use a lot of it. So I don't know how many cotton research labs there are in the world, but let's pretend that there's 100, and across them they're going to be doing 100 arrays a year. That's 10,000. That's about the size of a typical single print run from any of the, the major array producers. So that means that all the labs have to coordinate to be able to say, yes, there is enough stuff for us to be able to make it worth your while to print and create an array. So it's very difficult to get um, traction and financial, uh, good financial characteristics around that. So I think that's a big part of the problem. By contrast, if cotton is um, reasonably similar, say share 75 or 80 percent of its genes with Arabidopsis, uh, there's tons of Arabidopsis arrays, so you can get a lot of information without having to worry about Oh, first. Mm. So, the probe itself is uh, single-stranded DNA, so it doesn't do that. Uh, so that's one comment. The second is that these are generally done at reasonably elevated temperatures, so. Uh, the number's not in my head, but I think the hybridization is 60 degrees, or maybe it's 70 degrees. That's enough to make sure that no secondary structure should be forming in RNA. I'm sorry? Why would it hybridize? Oh, DNA and RNA multiplexes are thermodynamically more favorable than RNA-RNA. So there's a lot more thermodynamic advantage. But that being said, we typically put the RNA in excess on the array. So there is some of that happening, and sample gets lost, but instead there's still enough to be able to give good signal. And we don't have strong reason to believe that that formation of secondary structure or, or uh, auto self-hybridization will be biased towards some samples and not other samples. It's obviously biased towards some sequences, but what we're really looking at is, for this gene, are our results biased because of it, or is it just a uniform shift of signal? And it appears to be just uniform shift of signals. It doesn't have a uh, That's one of the many reasons why microarrays are not good at telling you this gene is more expressed than that gene. They're more a technique for telling you in this patient, this gene is higher than that gene is in this patient. I have at the back and then at the front. I'll get there. Yeah, I'll get there in, in five minutes in, in a lot of detail. And then after that, if you have questions, uh, so, so there's a lot of uses for two-color arrays. The, um, so there's a series of really beautiful statistical papers uh, in, like, nature reviews and genetics and things like that. Uh, back around 2003 that kind of showed how you could use these effectively for a very wide range of experimental designs. Uh, but the classic would simply be imagine that you have two groups, treated and controlled. Uh, imagine that you put the treated with the red and the control with the green and you compare them directly. Similarly, if you have an individual patient and you have a before and after treatment, 
then you can pair those together on the same array, and you can use that as a kind of control or ratio. So those are classic examples where um, two-color arrays are very natural experimental designs. Uh, they can be. So uh, the, that example of pre- and post-treatment is widely done in, in cancer studies, so it'll be the, the changes, and those could be done on, are frequently done on the same two-color array. So it's not a practical problem in terms of like it hinders your microarray analysis in some deep way. NGS does have better dynamic range. That's absolutely true. Um, but that dynamic range comes at a cost. Imagine that you sequence 20, 20 million reads, and you know, that's not a large sequencing experiment. You don't get better dynamic range or better accuracy than a microarray. Imagine that you sequence 500 million. You definitely do. And so there's some sort of a trade-off point at the number of reads, and there's been several calibration curves published. I feel like the number is 120 million, but I need to go back to the primary literature. But in short, that's kind of the trade-off. You'll have people say, oh, we'll do a RNA-seq for you for $175, but they're also producing so little data that a micro gives better, better signal. So there's kind of a, a trade-off level there between how much sequencing you do and how good your results are. But that's inherently one of the advantages of, of RNA-seq. You can make that trade-off. With a micro you can't. You can basically say, this is what I'm going to get for this price, and this is the quality of the data. And eventually, this technology is going to go away for most uses, because sequencing allows you that greater flexibility. Other questions? Are the volumes and the numbers um, so, I guess in the most, I guess it all depends on how recent. So, about 18 months ago, AFI released a new human array, um, which had more spots and a higher spot density than anything they'd released before. Um, and similarly, Illumina reached, uh, released a new um, genotyping, genotyping chip at that timeline as well, which was denser than anything that they'd done before. So, that's 18 months ago. I don't see another iteration or version of them that is denser. Both tech, both companies seem to be focusing on reducing the amount of input sample and view that as a strong, I think, I'm speculating, seem to view it as a strong competitive advantage versus um, sequencing. Because, for example, you can do a, a genotyping array from a few nanograms of material, and you probably don't want to do a reliable sequencing experiment less than 200 or 250. So... You know, that allows you to, to potentially access a biopsy-based market that is there. That's pure speculation. Other questions? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about each of these other types of uh, arrays. So inkjet arrays. Inkjet arrays started in 1999. It was the middle of the dot-com boom. The world was a happy, exciting place, and uh, HP went not getting as much credit for all of their wonderful computational work. And they thought that the problem was that the company was too complicated. Too complicated because they had all these other things like this really, really good machine that measured things extremely accurately and that did life science work. So they said, let's create a spin-off called Agilent. Agilent Technologies was going to have all that and then the computer company would exist and would be the one that would eventually ride the dot-com bubble and be super uh, successful. Didn't quite work out that way for HP, but for Agilent, this turned out to be a really great thing. Because Agilent was able to start looking at it and say, wait, this is our sister company. We can license any of their patents that we want for free. They're, we're, we're supporting one another. And therefore, they have a lot of patents on HP, printers. How to put a small quantity of liquid in a very precise location. That kind of sounds like a microarray how to put a very small quantity of something in a very specific location. So, they decided to try to see if printer technology could be harnessed to generate microarrays. Mm, I'm not sure if anybody recognizes who did this initial work. Uh, they're here in Toronto. No? So, Tim Hughes, is, Tim Hughes as his postdoc did this as his initial uh, work, and that's part of why he ended up getting a, a faculty position. And he basically developed the technology and did all the initial quality control of it. 
essentially the way it works, and so there's lots of proprietary steps here, but it's, it's really conceptual. Instead of having four die CYMK, you have four die ACTG. And instead of spraying a die at a spot, instead you go and spray a nucleotide at a spot. And you sequentially add nucleotides to spots one at a time, and they build on top of each other. We don't know the exact figure it or we will get a good estimate of what it is because we have a good idea of how Affymetrix does it, and I'll show that in a couple of minutes. The idea then is pretty simple. You've got a printer head. The printer head is moving around the glass slide and going dropping nucleotides step at a time. And that, with the same sound effect that I used, um, that will eventually lead to uh, the building up of an entire array. You can also immediately guess what are some of the challenges there then. If you're going to be moving this around over time, there's a limit before eventually the chemistries are going to start to say, oh, you've waited too long before fixing the sequence. In other words, you're limited in the length of the probes that you can print. And the limit is not short. We'll see in a couple of minutes, and it's in the 60, 70 base pair range. But it's not arbitrary. It's not thousands or hundreds of thousands of base pairs long. The other type of array that we'll talk about in a lot of detail are what are called photolithographic arrays. So photolithographic arrays were being developed right at the same time that Pat Brown's group was looking at printed arrays. In fact, they were both in California, both at Stanford, in different divisions. One was in robotics, and the other one was basically looking at the techniques used for making computer chips. So they coexisted for a long time, but photolithographic arrays are likely to be the last standard technique because they have very good error characteristics. Uh, does anybody know how photography works? What the technique is? Go for it. The back. Uh, Chris. Good. So that's kind of how we build an affymetric array. Kind of going back to photolithography, the, the critical aspect of it is photo, light, and lithographic, basically digging. So it's digging or building using light. Uh, and so uh, what we just taught, or what was just described, and I'll go over in a second, is how you can use light to build um, large nucleotide structures. It's also how computer chips are built. You've got a silicon wafer, you shine light selectively in certain parts, and that allows chemical reactions to happen in all of those locations. Uh, this was initially done by Affymetrix. There's other companies that do it, including There's a lot of issues around that for a very long period of time that only got resolved a few years ago. Here's the idea of how photolithographic arrays are synthesized. You start off with a wafer. The wafer is really critical. It has to be completely flat. If there's no flatness, if there's not complete flatness, sample will pool in certain parts of your array. It'll be a disaster. The uh, matrix itself is silenated. And it's silenated with hydroxyl groups, and that creates a, a generally sticky matrix all over. A linker molecule, we don't know exactly what's going on in the linker molecule, proprietary, um, is added to this wafer at every hydroxyl group. We don't know exactly what's going on, but it's almost certainly a sulfhydryl chemistry. We don't know the details. Uh, and this creates an ability to sequentially add things on top of one another. The linker molecule is kind of like a flexible, chemically reactive site. Then we do, just as Chris described, uh, using something called a photolithographic mask. So a mask sort of looks like this. It's a series of black and white spots. White where light can shine through, black where it can't. So it looks like that. Basically, you have a lamp, you shine light through this uh, mask, and only allow the light to shine on specific locations on the chip. Now, there's a couple of things here. One is, if you have a lamp, we have a lamp over there, the light doesn't all go parallel. Instead, it goes in all different directions. So there's this little blue ring. That blue ring is called a collimator. It's one of the most critical parts of the manufacture of a computer chip 
because it ensures that all of the light is going to be parallel. You can imagine why this is important. If the light wasn't parallel, if the light, com light coming out of this spot right here was at different angles, then some of it's going to go over here, some of it's going to go to the bottom of the chip, and instead of having very precise definitions of where there is light and where there is not, you're going to have fuzziness. The more fuzziness, the less accurate and less um, high quality your, your chips are. This is, of course, super critical for computer chips because even a couple of stray photons can activate a reaction in the wrong place, put a transistor where it's not supposed to be, and you're doomed. By contrast, with a microarray, there's a bit more flexibility to it. So the columnator is very critical. The light is almost always a UV source, although it can have different wavelengths. And the mask here is of different characteristics. It allows light to shine in different places. And it's actually quite expensive to produce different masks and to replace them sequentially. And so the design of masks and the careful decision of where they should go is one of the important aspects in developing uh, a microarray. So the idea here is that we take our initial side of the light wafer, to which we added these linker molecules, and we shine UV light in two places. We've divided the chip up into what we're eventually going to have to be features 1, 2, and 3. And we're allowing UV light to shine on features 1 and 3. Number 2 is protected by the mask. No light gets there. And the UV light activates the linker molecule in some way. Now it's able to undergo a chemical reaction that would not be possible in the absence of UV light. Let me make one other point here. This is also, of course, why it's critical to do this in a clean room. You can imagine that a single stray speck of dust coming in here will diffract this light, and that light will go in many different directions. So another one of the key characteristics in making microarrays or good computer chips is that you have a very low air particulate ratio. You want to have as few things in the air as possible. So if this works correctly, then only features 1 and 3 will be activated by the UV light. And now we're going to pass a solution of modified nucleotides over the chip. The modified nucleotides are going to have the uh, ability to bind to this linker molecule. And so here there are uh, A's. We have uh, uh, A's. There are A's binding onto the chip, and they will bind everywhere where the linker molecule is activated, features 1 and 3. And now we're simply going to repeat this. We're going to uh, protect features 1 and 3, activate feature 2 with UV light, pass over a different nucleotide onto the activated uh, area, and now feature number two has an initial signal. We can continue doing this. Uh, activate features number two and three with UV light. Um, once they're activated, pass over nucleotides, and we have built up the second base. You can do this sequentially as long as you like. Of course, the longer you go, the more likelihood a mistake will be. A mistake like an incomplete chemical reaction. And so, it's entirely possible that in one run, it won't be bound to an activated spot. Not by any fault of the, the experiment, but simply because kinetics works that way. It's always random chance probabilities that a reaction will go to a certain point. And sometimes it won't. The reaction won't go to completion. That's a big problem. Imagine now that we have this C and feature 2 that is not correctly had a G added to it. Well, the rest of the sequence on top of it is going to be wrong. And now you're going to have a hybrid sequence that seems to have an insertion deletion. It's going to bind to something that we don't want it to. So instead, uh, after you have your initial activation, you run some sort of a capping agent, some sort of something that blocks any activated sites. The capping agent, again, probably uses something like sulfhydrochemistry, and it's a very high affinity reaction and it's one that is inert, so it will no longer be active. So we lose some signal. That strand will be incomplete, but we don't introduce any additional And then we'd eventually build this entire chip up. And so you can see that here in this example, we have features 1, 2, and 3, and here is this capping agent. We have that actual strand that just didn't get completed, and if we kind of color code these differently, you can see we have four features, right next to each other with very little spatial separation, and each contains a series of equivalent oligonucleotides. Now, an affi array will typically be 25 base pairs in length. 25 base pairs, 
uh, four possible bases means that you would probably need 100 masks. With deconvolution and optimization, you can often get, instead of 100 masks, down to the 85 to 95 range. So you can be a little bit more precise and allow your, yourself to have some masks that will build up uh, different layers at different lengths of time. And figuring out how to do that optimally is one of the big challenges in chip design, to figure out the right way in which to add things, especially given that you probably don't want to be hitting adjacent spots too often, because the larger the adjacent more chance for there to be uh, edge effects of light diffracting around the side and going to places you don't want it to. Similarly, it's easier to build spots at the edges of the array than spots internally because you don't have to worry as much about stray light. So there's a lot of uh, characteristics that go into designing the order in which you do these syntheses and then the way in which your masks work. Your final chip is made on a 5 inch by 5 inch wafer, something like that size, I guess. Uh, five inch by five inch is puny. If we take a look at an Intel wafer where they're making like real computer chips, they're big circular things like this size where somebody has to hold them up with both hands. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that it's really important to do robust quality control for um, computer chips, but for arrays, not so critical. So you can make them in much smaller batches just more quickly. You can do them in smaller clean rooms. You don't have to worry as much about uh, a lot of the technical details. The second one is uh, we make a whole lot more computer chips a year than we make microarrays a year. So you don't have the same scale as uh, that's involved. You probably sell, I'm going to guess, four or 500 million computer chips a year, uh, but, you know, a few, maybe a million microarrays a year, something on that order. The wafer itself is five inches by five inches. But actually, that contains a lot of identical chips. And if you move down to the size of the individual Affymetrix array, leave aside all the plastic packaging. It's a centimeter and a quarter by a centimeter and quarter. That's it. All the rest of it is plastic packaging, microfluidics, and the entire thing is about a, a five-inch package. But the, in, the important interior part is just a centimeter. Uh, within that, the individual features are typically on the level of 10 microns by 10 microns. So there's been a little bit of a move to reduce that, as we talked about, but not dramatically. So I don't think they're smaller than 9 now, and 11 is a, a couple years ago when AFI released its last public information about this. So a, a kind of a 9 micron size is quite small, but relative to molecular things, that's large. So each individual spot contains millions of So you have a lot of replication at the probe level within each of those spots. So what we're actually detecting is the ability to see fluorescent signal on a range from zero to millions. So we have digital counts of how many of those probes show fluorescence at each of those different levels. And it's probably true that we are far more limited by our scans, which allow us to detect 65,000 grayscale levels than we are by the arrays, which potentially allow you to detect millions of different individual quantization levels. That was a question from Ashik. Question. So, how do we know the sequence of the individual genes? Sometimes we know it because the genome has been sequenced, and that gives us a lot of information so we can design it well. In other cases, the genome hasn't been sequenced, but there's a lot of intermediate information about the transcriptome. So, there's a, a technology called ESTs, or express sequence tags, which are useful for basically reading out a series of genes and identifying the large abundance ones, sequencing them. And there have been, or there were, a series of technique uh, studies that went to try to characterize ESTs for many different species, I guess mostly in the early 2000s. And so that provides a good estimate of it. Between those two, along with kind of gene-specific models, uh, inference of genes that are found across multiple species, uh, people come up with good estimates of the gene content for an individual species. And then from that, they design the probes that will best reflect those genes for the species that they're studying. Yeah? 
So what you're getting at is, are there different gene isoforms that might have different uh, consequences or effects from uh, tissue to tissue? So typically, um, most microarrays have their probes designed on the three prime end. The three prime is the least variable part of a gene. So that's one way in which companies try to get around it. That's not perfect. That just averages out the different isoforms. More, more recent arrays, so kind of the last couple of years, will often include probes for specific exons. So you can take a look at individual exons and say, is this exon expressed in this uh, uh, tissue or not? That's perfectly viable, just a bit difficult to, a bit more difficult to analyze, but it exists as a technology. Any other questions? Okay, so we have the Affymetrics chip. We have the chip itself, and we have the pictures on the chip. The next thing we have to consider is what we do with it. In the context of an Affymetrics chip, it's a little unusual. Uh, it's a little unusual, and this is a great trick question to ask students at committee meetings and things, because most people don't realize that Affy chips and photolithographic are fundamentally different in their sample prep for most other chips. Like everything else, you start off with total RNA. You do a reverse transcription to cDNA, and at this stage, many microarrays will incorporate a fluorescent label in the reverse transcription step, and they will take cDNA and hybridize it to an a standard expression microarray. That's a very reasonable approach. But instead, AFI arrays take the cDNA and do an in vitro transcription at that stage. So in vitro, they use the cDNA and transcribe RNA out of it. They incorporate a biotin label at this step, and now you've got biotin labeled complementary RNA. They then fragment that, hybridize that to a chip, and use the biotin with biotin streptavidin labeling to get a very, very robust estimate of signal. So there's two reasons why they do it. One is that biotin streptavidin conjugation is super powerful. Very, very strong interaction, which lets them get very sensitive signal detection. So it can potentially be more accurate than the simple use of fluorescent dyes. Another reason why you might want to do an array using complementary RNA instead of complementary DNA. Does anybody know? So I didn't know this until about four years ago when in this class somebody pointed this out to me and I went up and I realized this is entirely true and did some research on it. Single-stranded DNA is not stable. Single-stranded DNA is an unhappy molecule. Single-stranded RNA is a perfectly happy molecule. So it's much easier to store and save cRNA than it is to store and save cDNA, especially if you're going to be doing it in conditions that are not prone to um, hybrid to, um, uh, Watson and Crick base pairing, double strand. So actually, in these kinds of experiments, you're going to want to have for strand-specific analyses cRNA stored, which gives you a great resource that you're going to be able to keep. Obviously, double-stranded DNA is a much more stable thing than either of these, but single-stranded RNA is a very good thing to be able to store and you repeat hybridizations on, and that's the one of the primary reasons why this is done. So this is a fairly atypical sample preparation procedure that's been tweaked or optimized to try to maximize sensitivity and give you samples that you can reuse again later. At that stage, an AFI array is not different from anything else. You have your probes hybridized to one another on the, or your features and your uh, probes and targets hybridized to one another on the array itself, and you're using the uh, fluorescent signal from the biotin streptavidin conjugation to be able to uh, uh, recognize what intensity level there are. So this is what an Affymetrics array looks like. There's a couple of interesting features on this array. Does anybody see anything there that looks weird? Where? So this. What is that? Can anybody read it? Yeah. So, Affymetrix, sorry? Yeah. Affymetrix says, we're going to try to make it easy in case you forgot what kind of experiment you did. The control probes on your array spell out the name of the array. So it is impossible to lose track of what kind of an array you have if you did an Affymetrics array, because as soon as you have the image, if you go to your collaborator, so what type of array did you do? Affymetrics. Which one? Human. 
they sell 40 human arrays. Uh, you know, the human one. Then you can go and look at the image and go, oh, you did HGU133A plus 2. Great. So now you have an easy way of assessing what actually happened. This sounds like it's the kind of thing that should never happen. It's happened to me in my lab at least five times where we've been unsure what people did and they couldn't tell us, and you look at the picture and at least it tells you. So that's good. Uh, there's another key feature here that's quite interesting that we'll get back to. Do you see just next to my cursor, there's kind of a, a bright line or border. You can see it really clearly at the bottom here as well. So there's kind of a series of bright dots along the sides. Those are what are called landing lights. They give the computer, when it's doing the scanning, a specific spot to look at and say, here is the edge of my chip. These are the borders. And now it can kind of lock in on the borders and do its identification of where other spots are relative to that. We'll talk about how that works in a few seconds, but this is a very useful feature because it reduces the likelihood that you have incorrect identification spots. Before we go to beta rays, any other questions on AFI array? No, it's pretty robust. Complementary DNA to but and labeled complementary RNA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you need to have double stranded. Um, oh, you need to incorporate a label. So you need to have a label on your RNA, otherwise you can't do it. So you, you have to have a step that allows you to label the RNA. So if you have complementary RNA, then you need a way of taking that complement... I'm oh, sorry, if you have RNA, you have a need to have a way of incorporating the label. Um, I'm not aware of a robust enzymatic procedure for doing it. You need a way of kind of taking an RNA... You need an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to do that. And I don't think there is a robust RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. By contrast, there are robust DNA-dependent RNA polymerases. No Other questions on affirase? Okay. So we went back to molecular biology for a long time. Don't worry, we're going to go to pure bioinformatics in a couple of seconds. Uh, so the last type of array we'll talk about super briefly are alumina arrays, alumina beta arrays. So it's a very different technology. Uh, basically, instead of having an array, the physical location is fixed. Instead, you create a whole series of holes, tiny little holes, and create a little ball that is the same size as the hole. And on the ball, you have, which we call a bead, you put an address, something that tells you what type of probe it is, you put a probe sequence. So you have a 25 base pair probe sequence that's all coded by 100,000 of them. And now you have your, your whole little bunch of slots, and you randomly stick a bunch of balls into those slots. That's a kind of interesting idea. So the hybridization happens on those slots, and for some genes, you're going to have many identical balls measuring that gene. So it gives you a great assessment of internal error. On the other hand, your ability to measure that error is going to be different from spot to spot. So some genes are going to have only a couple of balls, maybe one or two. Other genes are going to have 10 or 15 balls. And so some of them are going to have very precise estimates, some of them you have less precise estimates. The idea is very innovative, and it certainly has a lot of potential. Uh, unfortunately, they're not particularly wide. I guess there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, arrays were the last developed technology. As a result, although their price is not too expensive, unfortunately they didn't attract a lot of attention in bioinformatics research. Bioinformatics researchers said, well, we've been working on microbes for a long time, it's exhausting, I don't really want to learn how to work with technology, plus there's this cool sequencing start thing starting to come up. So there wasn't a lot of research development of methods on beta arrays. Five base pairs typically, so they don't have a strong advantage. There's not a big selling point. By contrast, inkjet arrays 
60 to 70 base pairs. They came out at good times that performed research on them, and uh, they have good quality data, about equivalent to beta rays, probably. AFI rays are the most expensive, but they have the kind of good advantage of having very high quality data, the internal packaging, the high quality control, the actual sample prep, and they also have very extensive bioinformatics research. People spend the optimal way to analyze it. So we're probably maximizing the information content from the technology. Spotted arrays are super cheap. You could probably make a spotted array for 25 bucks today. Uh, the length of them is incredibly variable. So we published a paper in Lancet Oncology last year where we used spotted arrays with 25,000 base pair long probes. So you cannot do that remotely with any other technologies. On the other hand, it's an inherently noisy technology. It's very difficult to do robust quality control, but there's lots of bioinformatics research, so we have a good idea of how to maximize and handle that noise. So there are clear trade-offs between all of these. I think in the long term, it is likely that the high-quality, well-analyzed, well-understood affymetrics is going to end up being the last used microarray technology, and particularly in applications like quality control. You could imagine... If we had yogurt there, you'd peel off the cap of your yogurt and there would be a little tiny microarray underneath that would be sensing for the, the detection of bacteria that would tell you that your yogurt had gone bad. That's an easy application between microfluidics and microarrays and the kind of thing where that technology is probably going to last for a very, very long time. By contrast, in discovery, I imagine over the next five years, most of these array platforms will, will slowly vanish. Clearly, I don't endorse any particular technology. They all have their strengths and weaknesses, and we use all of them for different types of experiments. And you shouldn't just say, I'm going to use AFI because I like the sales rep. It's important to think through why you use a different technique and whether it's appropriate for the experiment that you're looking for. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, so essentially it's using a secondary probe that recognizes the address label. Yeah. Other questions? So my group has a, a paper that came back from a good quality journal with revisions. And the revision said, can you do some RNA stuff to, to give us confidence in your DNA-based assessments? And for, fortunately for us on that project, money wasn't limiting. And we had 80 samples that all we had to do was uh, generate the data and analyze. We chose to do microarrays instead of RNA-seq because... If we did the RNA-seq, we would still be analyzing the data two years later or 18 months later. With the microarray, we were able to get the samples to the array center, get the data back, finish the analysis, and get it into the paper in eight weeks. So there's clearly a turnaround time issue as well. Uh, and lastly, I guess uh, microarrays in some applications are probably superior and will be for a while. So there's no example of clinically used RNA-seq but there are clinically used microarrays. So if you have something that you believe today is good enough to go into the clinic and change patient management, then having it as a sequencing-based technology or test is not helpful. Having it as an array-based test would be really useful and apl applicable to an FDA application. So, so there's a couple of reasons why you would choose microarrays, even despite you know, potential greater accuracy, even if money wasn't limiting. Um, so it is a good idea, and it is perhaps not a absolutely standard thing to do because it's 
rare to have a thousand coding mutations in a so, tumor? I mean, one thousand differential expression genes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, and so yes. So if you have a thousand um, uh, genes, there's nothing difficult about making that assessment. It depends a little bit on the technology used, how sensitive it would be to that feature anyway. So for example, um, inkjet arrays would actually be quite sensitive to it. Affymetrix arrays would be less so. And so with some array technologies, we might be able to just ignore that issue entirely. No, 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 just isn't today. Um, just isn't today. The time frame for getting DNA-seq into clinical applications is a bit unclear, but probably you imagine over the next couple of years, RNA-seq will probably take a few years longer than that. So you might be looking at four or five, but making estimates on FDA approvals for things is something that large pharmaceutical companies suck at, so don't trust my estimates. Okay. Uh, Michelle, where are we time wise? Okay, good. Yeah, very good. So, I'm going to very quickly talk about what microarrays are used for and then spend the bulk of our time talking about how the data is analyzed. So, very quickly, uh, obviously, at a molecular level, we can interrogate a large number of different features using a microarray. So, we talked about how if we Make the hybridization conditions very stringent, we can go ahead and say we are going to infer directly the sequence. So genotyping directly, and you can essentially do resequencing on an array if you really want to. Similarly, you can do copy number analysis. In fact, genotyping arrays are frequently reused to get copy number analysis. You don't have to do anything special in terms of the uh, genomics data generation, you just have to play with the binary packets and are able to come up with the same array used to both genotype and come up with not too bad copy number estimations. Microarrays are still widely used for some capture type experiments. For example, one of the major ways of doing this is using a microarray to capture the coding regions, then a data off of the microarray. So microarrays are actually used in collaboration with sequencing experiments and also for a lot of genetic coding studies. On the RNA side, uh, a lot of the more novel applications of arrays involve things like where you would take uh, samples, you'd spike in using pulse chase types of techniques, modified nucleotides. You'd use those modified nucleotides to be able to isolate different fractions, newly synthesized versus not newly synthesized RNAs, and from that you can infer half-life or translation rates, things like that. So there's a lot of molecular applications, and they lead to a huge series of biological applications that you've probably heard about before or will hear about this afternoon. So categories, you can say, I compare drug treated to non-drug treated or drug resistant to drug sensitive tumors by genes that are different and might be that sensitivity. Uh, you can also do pathway analysis. Well, very, very commonly today, we're looking at new models for analyzing cancer. There are huge numbers of primary patient xenografts being developed. So I think here in Toronto, the number is that there's a thousand primary xenografts where somebody took a human tumor, put it into immunocompromised mice, and is growing it. A thousand of them. We want to know what the genomics okay? What are the genomics like? What are the characteristics of their transcriptome? How accurately do they model patient tumors? And can we use them to understand something about optimal treatment protocols? And then, of course, uh, the whole topic of my own work, which is classification, to be able to make predictions about patients of how drugs are going to work, whether a drug is going to be toxic to an individual. So, downstream analysis, you've seen pathways already, and you're going to talk about clinical integration today. And this kind of fits in between those two. An idea of how a microarray analyzed is kind of a pipeline or a pathway. So what you do is you start off with a, uh, a single glass slide, which has been scanned. And on that, you can see the series of spots and where they are and all the different features in them. And the first critical step is to take each of those probes and convert them into a series of numbers. That might be a series of two numbers, 
inside 3, inside 5 if you have the standard red and green dice, or uh, if you have a single channel array. Either way, we don't work with images, images are impossible to deal with, we start off by scanning it into values. Those quantitated values will be associated with several different types of noise that we sequentially try to remove in a series of steps. For example, there's background signal. There's non-specific hybridization in the region that we try to remove using different statistical models. We'll have some spots that are inherently poor quality. They have so little signal that we want to either remove them entirely or, or mitigate their effect on the experiment. We also have to do normalization. Different parts of the same array may have different error characteristics. There can be spatial trends that we need to remove. And when we do experiments, we usually do replicates. We always do replicates. And therefore, we have uh, options to have balancing the different arrays that we've done to make statistical analysis. Once we've done all that normalization, we might want to start doing statistical analysis or identify patterns using machine learning techniques or integrate with other types of data like what you've seen all week long. So what you're really talking about here are two fundamentally different things. The series of the first five steps about removing noise, processing, getting rid of unnecessary technical artifacts from your data. The second part is trying to extract information or extract meaning from it to draw biologically useful conclusions. We're going to talk a lot about the removal of noise because the removal of noise is, is a critical step and in some sense is exactly like the removal of noise from any other type of genomic technique. Yeah. Uh, I will, in five minutes, talk about it in lots more detail. So hold on, I'm giving you the overview and then we're going to go over each of these steps in lots of detail. Other questions? Let's go over the steps one at a time in a bit of detail. So let's start off with image quantitation. So image quantitation is basically the idea of taking these pictures and turning them into numbers that we want to interpret. So to change the qualitative information from the images to something quantitative. Microarrays didn't originally work this way. The first microarrays were images, and grad students looked at 6,000 green yeast arrays and went and said, ooh, that spot is darker than that spot. That spot is lighter than that spot. And they did this repeatedly over and over until they went insane. And so one of them goes, you know, I'm going to write a computer program to do this so that I don't have to do this much work. Uh, that I wish I was joking. So that's actually the way it started. And ultimately, we have to do this. This image analysis is not just a microarray thing. Fundamentally, image analysis is at the heart of most metabolomics and, of course, all next-gen sequencing. And it's potentially a major source of error because... It's difficult. None of us actually go into the images and look at it in a lot of detail, uh, which is something that we might actually need to do. The image analysis starts off with something that looks like this. This is a typical micro-experiment, and the first thing we have to do is figure out where all the spots are. Fortunately, we'll typically divide things into little subgroups, grids, that will allow us to have uh, kind of assessments of where things are. And by I, I think we all think we can sort of see where the grids are. The problem is, we've got to teach a computer to see where all the things are, and that's not an obvious thing how to do. I won't go into all the details on how this works. It's going to go and say, all right, let me go ahead and take a look at every pixel. And I'm going to take a look at all the pixels in this row, and I'm going to add them. And I'm going to go to the next row and add them in the next row. And sometimes there's going to be a lot of intensity, so I'm going to get a peak, and sometimes not very much. I'm going to do the same thing for every column. And now I'm going to look for peaks in the rows and peaks in the columns. And I'll say, ah, here is a peak, and here is another peak, and those correspond to this spot. And I'm going to use that as an initial estimate of where a spot is. Not a very good initial estimate. There's going to be lots of noise and spot-to-spot -spot variation, but that gives me a, an area to start. And then I'm going to grow around that spot, looking in circles, trying to identify... Where is the boundary of that actual spot? So that gives me a starting guess, and then I expand out from that starting guess. 
initially in spheres, and then when I start detecting intensity, I start moving in that direction until I refine on my, my best estimate of where the spot is. So that's how image segmentation works. Now, image segmentation turns out to be the easiest thing in the world because our arrays are not perfect. If our arrays were 100% reproducible with zero error, I wouldn't be talking to you about image segmentation as a big problem. But instead, there's all sorts of weird things that go on in any typical genomic experiment. For example, that. Is that a spot? Is that a little fleck of dust? Is that somebody's uh, uh, skin flake that managed to fall into the experiment as it was going on? Well, it's green, so it kind of looks like it's a spot, but it's not in a particularly normal location, and it's not obvious what it would be. Similarly, take a look at these two rows over here. You can sort of see some hints that maybe there are spots here. So maybe this grid, this row here, is the last row of this grid. Or maybe this is just noise, just like that's noise. That green spot is certainly more intense than this red one, or this, this little red one over here. So it can easily be either case. And we have to trust, A, our genomics is good, and B, that our segmentation is able to ignore these mistakes. After we identify when there is a good likelihood of something being messed up in genomics without introducing new types of noise. Unfortunately, this is a very, very difficult problem difficult that in most fields people have stopped even thinking about how the image segmentation is done. So for example, I think every lab I know trusts the Illumina-based segmentations for their DNA sequencers. I don't know a single lab that is doing it themselves or even developing algorithms for it anymore. There used to be a couple and now we just assume that the company gets it right. In fact, we usually do so for affymetrics arrays as well. So there's surprisingly little investigation even though any error at this stage will carry through to the entirety of your pipeline, every piece of your analysis. And it's probably a source of error in all your studies. So the last time that my team looked at this was maybe four years ago, and we did an assessment where I got some very poor grad students and undergrads to go ahead and look at spots. And we had an estimate that there was probably something on the order of 100 spots misgridded on every array. It's not the end of the world, right? 100 spots is not huge when you've got 20,000 genes and 10 probes for each of them is 200,000, but that's still a couple of hundred. That's a, whatever, 1% error rate or 0.5% error rate on every single array, which we hope is random, because it's random that it's, it's uh, not going to introduce a systematic bias, but certainly doesn't have to be. Uh, the only way to do it that I know of is to do manual spot checking. Uh, I don't know anybody who is doing this systematically anymore just impossible. We do experiments of 500 arrays, each of which is 20,000 spots. I can't afford enough undergrads to do that in the first place. So it's a, a significant challenge, but one that largely gets ignored at this stage in, in microarrays and essentially all genomic studies. There's a question at the back. Yeah, so if we have a feature, that feature contains um, millions of individual strands, um, but there are, for any gene, typically 1 to 10 features representing that gene. Um, yeah, good question. So imagine that your scanner was perfect, then yes, you absolutely could. But that would require something like a photon level scanner. We certainly don't use those. I don't even know if well, they exist. You can detect single photons, but nobody uses that for microarrays. So the scanners that we have have much more uh, thresholds of intensity. Now, how low it is in terms of molecules per cell, I'm not sure. I think it's in the order of one to two molecules per cell, but I need to really double check that. Two color array. Any two color array can have green, red, and one color array can have green, red. Oh, well, yes, or usually green. 
I think you can use feature and spot interchangeably. Okay. So image, image segmentation is a bit depressing. Uh, background correction is a little less depressing. Um, the idea here is that you've got stray signal or stray hybridization around each of your spots, and you want to remove them. This also turns out to be a very difficult problem, which could also benefit from a lot more research. The idea is that if you look at a typical array, you're going to see something that looks like this. You're going to see an interior strong point of signal. Around that, you're going to see this weird ring, which is probably some sort of diffraction effects. We're not sure. And then around that, you'll see background. The background is hybridization that doesn't get washed off that's unrelated to the genes that's binding, and that has a spatial bias across the array. And so when you take a look at this, what you really want to do is to be able to take the foreground and remove this background signal, which we think is entirely noise. And so we think that it should be simple. All we do is have the signal as the foreground minus the background. Of course, simple things don't always work, uh, and this fails miserably. It fails miserably for a whole series of reasons. The primary one is that we often see cases where the background is where we have more noise than we have signal. That's weird. That's weird in a lot of fundamental ways because if the background is really background, it should be adding to all of the spots, not just the stuff next to the spot. Um, and that's a huge problem. Negative, negative signal is a huge problem, number one, because it's biologically implausible. Number two, because the vast majority of statistical analyses assume that microarray data is log-normally distributed, which means we have lots of log transforms, and log transforms of negative numbers are not happy things. Uh, and so you end up with very huge difficulties downstream in your pipeline. A lot of people have been trying to figure out why this happens, because it's 2% of spots in some experiments. 2% of spots. So, I mean, that's, that's looking at potentially a couple of thousand... Um, genes would be affected by it, depending how those spots are distributed. The reason it happens is not really clear, but a couple of groups, one at Argonne National Laboratories, did some really beautiful work using what's called a hyperspectral scan, which basically scans all the different wavelengths. And what they showed is that if you have an empty spot, it has less signal than the background. So if you have a spot that has no binding whatsoever, it actually quenches the fluorescent signal. That's very, very interesting. Uh, it suggests that there's some sort of DNA quenching going on with several of the dyes. And at the same time, they also showed that several of the chips and the glass used in the chips would all fluoresce. So this leads to two consequences. Uh, the important one is that unbound spots are particularly prone to problems. So unbound spots, what might that be? Well, that would be low-expressed genes, stuff that is unimportant in cancer like tumor suppressors, transcription factors, lots of signaling, ah, oh, darn. So we have a big problem. The genes that we care about in cancer are particularly prone to this problem. So we need to figure out ways to address it. And a series of fairly intensive statistical models were developed. There are three that are in wide use. Uh, they are associated with the names of the people who did them, Edward Smythe and Cooperberg. And they fundamentally differ in their assumptions about the signal and noise in the microarray spot. So Edwards assumes that the um, signal is normally distributed and, sorry, other way around, the error is normally, try this one more time. Edwards assumes that the error is logarithmically distributed and the signal is linearly distributed. Smythe assumes a normal exponential convolution and Cooper is a very complicated based model. Uh, the, the mathematical underpinnings of these is extremely advanced and something that we could talk about for like an hour. So I'm going to skip that based on a summary of how you might think about it. The Edwards model is fast, so it runs in a few seconds on a typical micro experiment. Uh, and it's reasonably accurate. It's certainly better than doing like subtraction or anything like that. By contrast, the Cooperberg is very slow. The last time I, my lab did a Cooperberg experiment was, I guess, three years now and we left it running for about a week and a half to get the background correction done on a couple hundred arrays. So, I mean, it's slow. And it's slow because it's taking into account everything, like the number of pixels per spot, how many of those pixels have this type of expression level, the number of background pixels, how those relate to one another. But it's thought to have the best accuracy. 
Assessing good, better, best is a very difficult thing here, because how do you design an experiment that isolates background effects? Fundamentally, background effects are based on non-specific hybridization, so it's hard to come up with a controlled experiment that would allow us to accurately assess this. So the way these numbers were assessed as good, better, best was using something entirely different as a downstream metric, like how accurate you were at doing a certain classification task. It's not a terrible idea, but it's also not a great criteria for making your algorithm selections up front. So background correction is important, and we have several techniques that can do it. But on the other hand, we don't really have full confidence in how we can do those techniques. Fortunately, that's a much better situation than what we get into with spot quality. Spot quality turns out to be extraordinarily difficult. The idea is that we should identify artifacts, things that are not correct in your experiment. We want to identify all the mistakes and fix them. Unfortunately, we don't really know how to do it, and it's an extremely difficult research problem. Uh, the conceptual idea is very simple. If you have a large-scale experiment that has 250,000 spots on your microarray, they're not all equally good. Some of them are going to have very robust signal. That's perfect. Maybe we give those a score of 1, because they're perfect. Some are going to be completely garbage. The manufacturer of the array was poor, and the net effect of it is that they're useless. Those should get a weight of zero. We shouldn't even look at them. And of course, there are all the spots that are in between. The problem, of course, is how you come up with those numbers between zero and one. How do, how do we assess that? And there's a few approaches that have been widely used in the literature. For example, the mean median correlation. The idea is that we would take the mean of the pixels in a spot, the median of the pixels in a spot, and take the ratio. If the ratio is exactly one, the mean and the median are identical, and at least the distribution of those pixels is symmetrical. It's nice. By contrast, if it is very skewed in either direction, it tells us something fundamental about what's going on in the spot, and that the distribution is not uh, certainly not normal, and it's not what we might expect. By contrast, other groups have looked at things called composite Q metrics, quality metrics. What they would do is take a look at things like the circularity of a spot. You can come up with a number between 0 and 1 that tells you how circular a spot is. Or you can take a look at how elastic it is, how much variability there are between the pixels within a spot. And these metrics, when they put together, can do quite a good job at improving what we call the homotypic signal to noise. You take the same sample, hybridize it against itself, and see how much noise there is. You expect to see everything having exactly the same signal. The deviations is the signal-to-noise ratio. Unfortunately, all of these approaches fail randomly. And when I say randomly, I really mean it. You'll sometimes take a look at it and see a spot and go, that is perfectly good. Why is that being called as bad? Or you have huge artifacts in your experiments and go, I don't believe that. Why on earth is that uh, being used? And instead, it'll say, oh, this is a, a good quality spot. And so the question that you always get asked when you do this is, do I really need to worry about spot quality? So I'll show you a few examples of whether or not you need to worry about spot quality. So here's a nice little uh, segment of a two-color array. You can see here is a halo of background around the saturated, very intense spot, which is bleeding into the spots around it. That bleed of halo into the spots around it is going to affect the background signal from the neighboring spots. Okay, that's not a terrible thing. By contrast, this is probably a terrible thing. Some sort of a dust moat here is impinging directly on two spots. There's no ability to distinguish this spot and its fluorescent ability from that spot, and essentially you're seeing a large introduction of noise. <coughs> here you have a combination of those two. This is some sort of a dust event, who knows what it is, uh, which has created a large halo of signal in the surrounding region that is affecting multiple spots in their background. This is probably a printing artifact where the printer actually moved, and you can see that the DNA from these two spots is even being mixed. And look at this weird thing where there's a little pseudo spot off to one side. Segmentation is going to have disasters with that. And of course, all of those are from a single array, quality array that we analyzed and published on several years ago. So there's nothing that stops you from using data like this if you're able to potentially address it. But the problem is, 
we have to be able to address all those issues. Now, when I show stuff like that, somebody will always say, yeah, that was a two-color array. Affymetrics or whomever other array type that they use, and it'll be so much better. Well, I spent some time telling you that affymetrics arrays are the highest quality. That's very true. Let's take a look at some affymetrics data and see high-quality data. So here's the nice array which shows a very, very clear pattern of signal increase in one corner of the array, almost as if there was a little grease mark from somebody's fingertip on it that changed the hybridization temperature. Uh, here's another one where you see very, very clearly uh, a pattern. Oops. Where did it go? There we go. Uh, a pattern of unusual uh, center distribution here. Uh, probably related again to some sort of weird hybridization characteristics, and you have a thumbprint on the side of your array. So you'd say, that's fun. Oh, those can't possibly be a good affymetrics array experiment, but those are from the standard athlete data set done by them themselves on their website that we can go and use as the exemplar for the best quality affymetrics data that you should use for designing studies. That's a good example of it. Similarly, a look at a very interesting experiment that we did, you can see what Christian mentioned a few minutes ago, a line here. That's weird. Why is there that line here? Well, this was the third array in our experiment. The fifth array, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six lines. That's weird. By the eighth array, you can see a lot of lines. Anybody know what, what's going on and why we have all these lines in our experiment and we're getting more and more as we go on? Any guesses? Different samples. Uh, it's not eight, though, but yes, it is. It is proportional and correlated. It's just, it, yeah, it's not, not linearly related, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, what do you think is causing it? Michelle knows, though. <laughs> Unfair. I want to hear a guess from somebody else. Affymetrics array, um, rat samples treated with a drug. No, it's purely experimental. Something that went wrong in the experiment. No, so that's a good guess. Yeah. Sorry, so let me answer that first. An equal hybridization is a good guess, but it's weird that it would happen in very ordered rows. Chemical reactions don't, yeah. Hard to imagine that, how the, what the mechanism of that would be. You were going to guess? So, so the answer is simpler. Uh, imagine that you're scanning an array. The scanner goes in order. Going all the way across the array. As the scanner is going in order, it has to have a lot of power to be able to do the scanner. So it contains a, a piece of equipment called a capacitor that stores a lot of charge. The capacitor was a bit tired. So in the first array, it's got lots of energy, goes on the second array, it goes by the third one, it's going okay, 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 let's not do this. So eventually, it got tired, and it wasn't holding as much charge. So basically, the capacitor wasn't charging fully, wasn't allowing to have complete scanning effects, and you see this huge spatial artifact. Now, number one, it's trivial to remember but when you see it's there. Like, that's pretty straightforward. You know, X, Y coordinates on an array, and you could fit a simple model to remove that effect. That's fine. But number one, you have to look at your data to see it. And number two, auto-detecting that trend is quite challenging because you can't go through and think of every possible thing a scanner did wrong because, like, this is one that we've never seen before or since. So that gives you a, a kind of feel for the fact that spot quality is fundamentally an issue Regardless of the platform, regardless of the technique, we pretty much never talk about quality, and certainly not at this level when it comes to sequencing studies. Let's just say that there is equally problem with sequencing data sets that we analyze in terms of quality, and we just don't know how to address it in general. People try to have manual flagging, where you get very bored undergrads to go ahead and look at spots and go, good, bad, good, bad. Uh, unsurprisingly, undergrads are not very enthusiastic about it, and if you take two or three of them, their concordance differs by between 5 and 20%, which is really what you'd expect, and we have far too many spots to do this. 
So spot quality is a huge unsolved issue. In my mind, it's probably the single biggest issue in the pre-processing of all genomic data. Most investigators ignore it, and any bioinformatician who does this stuff seriously struggles with it and struggles with it and struggles with it. Eventually, they ignore it, too, because we have no good solution. And I think if you want to make improvements in bioinformatics, this is the single biggest open field. If we're able to do a better job of quality assessment on our individual spots. So, like, three or four minutes ago, I think Angelina had a question that I... Array? Array itself, are these all over or yeah, so it depends on the array platform. So um, we'll talk about how Affymetrics does its replicates in a bit of detail. So they do theirs having, the replicates are not pure replicates. They're different parts of the same gene, different sequences to the same gene, and they are spatially distributed around the array. By contrast, some of the Agilent arrays have exact technical replicates, duplicates, which are adjacent. So it can suffer from spatial effects, and others do not. So there's a huge amount of variability to whether there are technical replicates and what kinds of replication they are in spatial distribution. Beta rays have technical replicates that are spatially distributed all the time because they're inherently randomly structured arrays. from the lab in January. Looked at it. No, fortunately they caught it very early and went, why does this look like this? And I said, <laughs> yes, why does this look like this? chips are scannable. Yeah. yeah um, so I'm not 100% on it. <laughs> yeah, we haven't ever seen other patterns. Uh, and I guess the, the scanner is also scanning a band of 
take a look at any uh, drone bioinformatician kind of in the microarray analysis field, they'll have a series of papers on spot quality assessment. So, for example, what was it called? It was called Music was the name of the, the group, but there is a UK consortium that got non-trivial amounts of funding to uh, try to resolve this, and Wolfgang Huber's group, so he produced one of the standard algorithms used for microarray uh, analysis, still uh, published a couple of papers. Audrey Thompson, I think, is the first author. I think that's it. Um, uh, Raphael Irizarry, who developed RMA, an algorithm we'll talk about uh, as well, wrote a series. So there's a lot of literature on people attempting to fix this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. So a couple of the people who came from proteomics builds and tried to apply similar techniques. It's the same problem where some stuff works and doesn't work for large classes of errors. Any other questions? I'm going to just do a time check. I bet 10.05, 10.08. Okay, so we're going to be running something on the order of 15 minutes late. So just to prep you, in about 10 or 15 minutes, I'll ask if you want to go for a coffee break or go for like 15, 20 minutes longer and then come back after coffee break. So in about 10 minutes, I'll ask you that. All right. So spot quality. Spot quality is impossible. Nobody researches it anymore. We don't know how to fix it. Very fortunately, we then go on to visualization. So in case you are getting depressed by the fact that we can't fix quantitation, background correction, spot quality, normalization turns out to be easier. Uh, the idea here is that we've got spatial biases within arrays, spatial arise biases of different types, and we want to remove them. We want to bring them to a, a common distribution so that spots on different parts of the arrays have similar error characteristics. While this turns out to be a difficult thing to do in some sense, it is extremely intensively researched, even today. You'll find papers published almost every month on this, uh, and it's probably close to being a solved problem. You've got three basic classes of spatial trends or biases that you might have. One is simple spatial gradients. So you start off with um, an underlying array, and on top of that array, you have a spatial bias because it's some sort of characteristic uh, lack of flatness in the array. Straightforward and simple to take uh, account of. Second, of course, you hope that your initial sample is going to have amounts of your two colors if you have a two color array. Unfortunately, nobody is a perfect and therefore you're going to have some random stochastic differences in it. Also, you have something called intensity bias. Intensity bias is pretty interesting. What you're looking at here is homotypic hybridization. X and Y axes are signal intensities for uh, uh, the individual hybridization. So it's the same sample analyzed twice. And you can see, of course, that it's pretty darn linear. Notice that it's not exactly linear, like it's not a straight line. This is not atypical. This is kind of the level of noise that you might expect. Uh, and within that, you can sort of see that most of the spots fall within these dashed lines. Great. But you'll also notice that most of these spots fall within these dashed lines, independent of whether or not they have intensities of 65,000 or intensities of 5,000. So you're seeing the same amount of noise, same uh, plus minus for a spot that has 5,000 or a spot that has 65,000. That's actually a bit of a problem because now we have a difference of 5,000 plus or minus 5,000 versus 65,000 plus or minus 5,000. Obviously, in the latter case, we're going to have much more confident estimates. So we have variance that's proportional to our signal. And there's a need to do what's called variance stabilization so that we're able to make accurate inferences. And that's really important if we have a gene that goes from very highly expressed to very lowly expressed, like deletion of a tumor suppressor. If we do not, then we have strong heteroscedasticity, which will be important to account for in our statistical models, and we have this unequal noise characteristic that even makes the next stage of normalization difficult. This turns out to be 
I mean, I don't want to call it ridiculously easy to analyze, but it, it turns out to be simple. Uh, if your the array data set has large amounts of spatial effects, then simple Gaussian spatial smoothers will remove them with high reliability and in a few seconds of computer time. By contrast, in the vast majority of arrays, the intensity-based effects turn out to be more important. And so something called a lowest smoother, a locally estimated scatterplot smoother, is widely used and is implemented in the command in R called huh, Lois uh, to allow you to remove these types of effects. And lastly, sometimes you'll see what are combination effects. Both types of error will be present simultaneously. And in that case, what are called splines, it's a kind of cubic polynomial, can be fit iteratively across the array to allow you to, to come up with good estimates of removing the, the noise. All methods are well established and all be run by a single line in R and never really require any thought or, or justification to, to a journal. And if we found that easy, we eventually get to inter-array normalization. Inter-array normalization is very intensively researched, but is, is as close to a solved problem as you'll have in my craze. Um, essentially, the idea is that if we do multiple experiments, pipette error or other characteristics can lead to differential loading or intensities of samples between different arrays. And so you want to scale the arrays. Imagine that you have an experiment that looks like this. Each of these are a different array or a different channel of an array. The y-axis is the fraction of spots that have a certain intensity. And of course, the x-axis is the intensity. So it's just a distribution. And you can easily apply a scaling algorithm to bring these to a common distribution. They look far, far more similar. Now, uh, there's something very characteristic about this array experiment. Actually, just looking at those plots, you should be able to tell what type of experiment it is. Can anybody figure out what we're looking at from this? Any guesses? It's a two-color array, but there's something about the biological, what we're studying biologically, that turns out to be really evident from these plots. What is it telling you about, though? There's something, yeah. There's something there biologically. Yeah, what is that peak? peak. Biologically. What, what might it be? Any guess? You're on the right track, very much. Not overexpression. Not overexpression. Sorry? On the right track, so this is, as soon as you see this profile with the secondary peak over here, immediately you go, this is a chip chip or a rip chip or an enrichment experiment. Um, basically, what you're seeing is this large peak here at the intermediate intensities is all noise. And this little peak here is the actual binding and signal in the experiment. So that's the characteristic pattern of an enrichment experiment. Now, it gives you a little bit of contrast of, how many of the spots are complete noise and have a, a nice noise distribution, and how many are the signal? Now, so that turns out to be very easy to handle. It allows us to kind of say that we've closed the door on how we remove noise. We start off with an image. We quantitate it into a series of numbers. We use some mathematical models to do background correction. We at least think about spot quality, even if we don't do a whole lot on it. Then we use some sort of a spatial smoother or an intensity smoother to remove internal effects to each array. And then eventually we balance all the different arrays on the experiment. And as a battery, that's the way in which we remove noise on the study. And that is very, very similar to how we would analyze a, a sequencing experiment fundamentally. A series of steps that start with the image and eventually remove different types of noise until we get with a series of data that we can start doing real analyses on. Go for it. So I think it's pretty close to being an automated pipeline. That being said, you don't really run the pipeline, you run the pipeline, and then you investigate all these characteristics to go, well, what does that look like? And how does this work? And so you think about whether or not, for example, it's a good idea to actually look at the images for all your arrays. Not spend hours doing it, but if you have 50 of them, then you know, 30 seconds on each one is a valuable exercise. Mm -hmm.
Most of these are pretty minimally, minimally parameterized algorithms. It's actually quite clean that way, especially relative to uh, sequencing data. Not too much. Typically, your choice is algorithm A versus algorithm B error profiles rather than reparameterizing algorithm A. that are in, in any sort of regular use anywhere. Um, there's a couple of basic things, like you have a negative control probes and positive control probes, and you verify that the negatives are negative and the positives are positive, but in a kind of systematic QA, QC, no, I'm not aware of anything. So, we're at quarter after, 20 after. How do you guys feel about taking a coffee break now and then coming back and talking about the next steps of it for probably 20, 25 minutes before getting to the practical? I'm okay if you want to keep on going for another 10 or 15 minutes, but this is a nice logical point. Thoughts? So, wait. Green. Green if you want to take a coffee break now. Red if you don't want to take a coffee break. Okay, we're going for coffee. <laughs> So, coffee break now, and then we'll come back and pick up the next step. Uh, in how long? 30 minutes? Yeah, 30 minutes, so what is that? Uh, 10 to. All right, let's get started. So, where we left off. We had come to the conclusion that pre-processing your data is uh, sometimes hard and sometimes easy, depending on which part of it, and that people like to study the easy things. We're going to very quickly focus on... Uh, for a little bit on the idea of how we uh, extract information from it, and then we'll zoom in a little bit into uh, how affymetrics arrays work with a bit of detail. So very quickly on significance testing, this is what you're going to talk about a lot this afternoon. Um, in some fundamental way, statistics is statistics, and just because you do it for microarray data, it doesn't change all that much. That being said, statistics for microarrays has a couple of unique features. Uh, there are some ways to take advantage of the dimensionality. And the most common statistics questions that we get in microarray data are clearly, are two groups different and if two things synergize? There's also a lot of work on survival analysis that's increasingly becoming important. Uh, and machine learning type predictors are becoming important. Uh, and so we're going to focus on number one in the practical session, our, our example work. But in some sense, you can think of once you have your data, you apply the statistical model that is most appropriate pretending that it's not microarray data. And that's not a, a bad approximation of what you should be doing. We'll spend a little bit more time now talking about clustering. Clustering is a branch of machine learning. Um, machine learning is something that I think everybody here has used today. Who used machine learning today? Hands up. Just three people, four people today. Only four people. Uh, so, that's your email machine learning. Maybe. The spam filtering machine learning. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, anybody else? No? Uh, how many people took the stairs to come up here? The rest of you, <laughs> the rest of you took an elevator. The way your elevator allocation works is machine learning. Has anybody, while I was talking, because they found my talk boring? Good. Um, everybody who may have Googled for other reasons, that's machine learning. Uh, stock trading, automated stock trading, high-frequency stock trading would be a machine learning algorithm. Uh, if you're trying to take a look at, does anybody wager on sports? You don't have to answer that question, but if you do, the odds are being set using machine learning algorithms as one of the major determinants. Um, weather, anybody look at the weather today? Weather prediction is machine learning, so I could keep on going. But in short, it's probably one of the most important parts of your life is the ability of computers to predict what the heck is going on. So unsupervised machine learning is a very, very tiny part of the field. When I say tiny, let's pretend that we get a canonical textbook, the kind of stuff that you give to a fourth-year undergrad or a first-year grad student. About 500 pages. The classic one is called Pattern Classification. Uh, in those 500 pages, there's one chapter. 12 pages on unsupervised machine learning, and the rest of it talks about other types of machine learning. So it's actually a very tiny part of the field, but one that we use very frequently in bioinformatics. It's sometimes
called clustering. Not the same thing. Um, clustering is a type of unsupervised machine learning, and it's about finding patterns in a data set. Each individual pattern or type of cluster is a very small branch of machine learning and probably extremely overused in bioinformatics. Probably is the wrong word. It is extremely overused in bioinformatics. It generates pretty pictures like this. This is a terrible picture. Uh, is anybody in the room red, green, colorblind? Okay. So I forget the exact number. It's, I think, 3% of the male population. Uh, and in particular, it's uh, very likely in people of certain ancestry. So imagine you submit your paper to Nature, and by chance it goes to three reviewers in Northern Europe, you know, Germany, Finland, etc. Then I believe the number is 1 in 79 chance that one of them will be red, green, colorblind, and you've annoyed your reviewer with this figure. So red, green is a bad color choice. It should probably be red, blue. Either way, this is what we would call a cluster gram. It has a couple of really interesting parts. That top part of the dendrogram. Which length is proportional to how similar those samples are using some sort of metric. Uh, map itself is the coloring, and the more intense the color, the more intense the signal ought to be. So for example, here, dark red is highly upregulated, and dark green is very highly downregulated, and black is in the middle, and that's a weird color choice pattern. So when would you do it? And we're looking at how they respond by Stimuli. The x-axis is stimulus 1, and the y-axis is stimulus 2. And you can see, here are some genes that go up in both, other genes that go up in stimulus 2 and down in stimulus 1, and so forth. And you can see that I drew these circles that I claim are clusters. Well, a computer is going to try to do the same thing. It's going to try to draw the circles. The way in which it's doing so is to employ two very, very simple heuristics. First, it looks at how tight the cluster is. It asks, what is the separation of things within an individual cluster, the average difference between individual elements within a cluster, for example? And it wants that to be as small as possible. You want to make the clusters nice and tight, so everything within it looks very similar. You also want to make sure that your clusters are separated by a large distance. And there's some sort of a trade-off here. So if you're going to be able to have lots of um, clusters, the number of clusters uh, can go down to having one cluster for every data point, which is great, the clusters are super tight, but now they're going to be unfortunately close together because all of the genes are going to be right next to one another. So you're kind of looking at how to balance the intercluster difference and the intracluster distance. And those two things together are essentially the metrics that we trade off in any clustering algorithm be it hierarchical or k-means or, or uh, whatever we choose to use. And so generally, we try to do min-max, minimizing intercluster and maximizing intercluster. And in some algorithms, we'll pre-specify the number of clusters. In other cases, we'll allow the algorithm to inherently figure it out. And it's trade -offs in the assumptions that are made there. So you don't avoid making assumptions. You just choose different assumptions that might be most uh, useful for your problem. Probably four major reasons why we use it in bioinformatics. Let me rephrase. There are four good reasons to use it in bioinformatics. There's a lot of bad reasons. Number one is visualization. These cluster grams are kind of pretty. And especially if you won't annoy your reviewers, and it's a nice way to visualize a lot of simultaneously. That's one good reason to do it. A second good reason is to predict class assignment. I'll talk about that second, or to identify co-regulation. Those are five genes that tend to move together. The last reason is to do quality control. In early microarray studies, people would run all of the arrays that the center had done. And see patterns that would look like this, but a series of arrays that would look very similar to one another. And they'd go, ah, we have discovered some types of cancer. And then somebody would go, that's weird. Those four arrays they were all done by John, and those other four arrays were all done by Jennifer. And have you noticed that the data completely clusters by And so clustering turns out to be a really 
biases in your data to identify quality control metrics. So when you cluster your data, you'll say, here are the most natural, strong trends in the data. And do they correspond to a biological phenomenon, like tumor versus normal, or do they correspond to a technical one, like the that I ran my experiment, or the person who was working on it, or the batch of arrays that I used? And imagine that over time, in a large experiment, the technology changes. Well, do you see those different technologies as different batches in your cluster? Or instead, do they turn out to be intermingled, suggesting that your normalization is working better? So it's a very effective method of being able to assess the quality of your data. Let's talk quickly about class assignment. So, example of that. Uh, most genes, we don't know their function. There's about 1,500 yeast genes without assigned functions, and about 12,000 where all we have is electronically so 1,500 in the most studied organism, yeast, is quite shocking. It's 25%. Um, so you might think you might be able to come up with good inferences about their function just based on patterns of expression. I mentioned before Tim Hughes and his work in developing agile arrays. Well, the other thing that he was involved in was applying them to the first study, the first major application. And what he chose to do was to take all of the yeast knockouts that he could get his hands on and run a microarray on them say, let's cluster this data. And what it found out is that there would be clusters of genes that would be involved in mating. And you'd see, here's a group of 10 genes that are all involved in yeast mating. Oh wait, 9 of 10 are involved in yeast mating. 1 of 10 has no known function. Interesting. Across these 500 experiments, those genes go together. They're highly correlated. Therefore, I predict that the number 10 gene is also involved in mating experiments, and they are able to show that this does a reasonably good job, 60-70% at making estimates of gene function. So this is a great example of how you can infer information about unknown cases by using unsupervised methodologies. That being said, clustering is a very wide use thing. Uh, I said it's overused, and some of the uses are, are terrible. I cannot tell you the number of times where I will show a heat map, and then somebody... I don't want to say a clinician, even though it is often a clinician, will point and go, these are the genes that I want. And you go, well, we'll do a statistical analysis to figure out if there are any of them are statistically significant. And none of the genes will be statistically significant. And then they'll say, but those are the genes that I want. And these are fundamentally different endeavors. Clustering is not a replacement for statistical analysis. It can never be. In fact, it's less powered than statistical analysis will be. It doesn't give you assessments of p-values in the way that you'd like. It's just a way to visualize the data. And, of course, that means some people will say, okay, I know what to do. I'm going to go ahead and do my statistical analysis, and then I'm going to cluster it and see if it gives the trend that I want. Well, okay, so if I select the genes that are going to be different between tumors and normals and then cluster them, I'm going to see tumors and normals cluster differently. That's almost definitional. So clustering is either a visualization tool, in which case you can do it before or after statistical significance, or it's a way to see the largest trends in the data set, in which case you have to use the whole data set. As soon as you apply that statistical filter, now you've biased it, and you can't infer anything from the clustering profiles. It certainly doesn't replace standard statistical analysis, and it doesn't give you, or it doesn't give you inherently an assessment of chance. But actually, it's almost trivial to do so. So if you've ever seen a phylogenetic tree, there's a confidence interval on each one of those branches on a phylogenetic tree saying, we are this confident in it. There are lots of techniques for doing that. Similarly, if I think that my technicians show different effects that cluster together, there are lots of metrics that will allow me to assess whether my, my technicians show non-biased clustering patterns. But if you don't apply them and you just look at the data and go, oh, that looks non-random to me, that's not particularly meaningful. So a good clustering should also be associated with statistical evidence to support what you think you're claiming from it. So if you remember the following things. Micro data is summarized with a pipeline of algorithms, and that's your standard workflow. And remembering that pipeline is critical because then you look at an experiment and go, it steps out of the pipeline. That's the pipeline. Sometimes with some technologies, there will be steps split, but these key characteristics are present in just about every microarray. The second point is this is still an active area. 
still see a microarray analysis paper published at least every month, probably a couple a month. So that's on the order of 20 plus new methods a year. Those methods in some cases are better than what people use. And there are opportunities to get more value out of a micro experiment simply by reanalyzing it five years later. And lastly, what I've showed you holds true for all micro platforms and types, obviously with some type specific changes that would be added or, or subtracted from it. The vast majority of micro analysis happens in a, a R based environment called Bioconductor. Bioconductor basically happened when a series of high profile statisticians came together and said, as microarray data, but I don't really want to have to worry about how you read those file formats and how you do those sorts of things. Can't we make a standard library that we can all use so I can put my effort into uh, doing the interesting statistical problems? And they built a highly robust, widely used software framework called Microsoft. That is the majority of how microarray data is analyzed. The majority meaning easily 95%. There are non-bioconductor approaches, which are sometimes really, really good. Uh, but it's a safe bet that if somebody did something using they are more likely to have gotten it using best-in-breed algorithms than if they didn't. And I often, at this point in time, tell a quick story about commercial software for analyzing microarray data. So one of the most common algorithms for analyzing Affymetrix data is called RMA. We'll talk about it in a few seconds. RMA was initially implemented in Bioconductor, in R, and a bug was found was found a few months after it was first released, and so they changed it. Uh, at the same time, a, I'll leave it nameless, commercial software package said, oh, this is the new standard, so we implemented it. It took them over four years to fix the bug in the commercial software package that was fixed in R within a month. And so for years, you could be buying this, getting, I am doing RMA just as everybody tells me I should, and get numerically wrong answers. Bioconductor has a huge advantage because the people who are developing it use it every day. So if there's a bug, then they're going to go to their grad student or their programmer, fix this, or else all of the analyses we do are going to be incorrect. And because they're doing analysis all the time, these changes happen very rapidly. So there's a big advantage there to the open source software over the commercial software in terms of the up-to-date and up-to-datedness and correctness of the analyses. So I said that there's some technology-specific characteristics. Let's talk quickly about an Affymetrix-specific workflow. So here's our generic workflow. In Affymetrix, we're going to ignore quantitation because it's the Affymetrix default. Uh, it's a one-channel array, so there's no size 5. Of course, we all ignore spot quality because we have no idea what to do. It's a single-channel array. We're going to do intra and inter-array normalization in one step. That doesn't mean that they're being ignored. We just do them simultaneously. And if we rephrase and collapse that a little bit, we get this pipeline. We start off with the quantitative data. We do a background correction, a normalization. We have to do a probe set annotation for 11, typically. There are typically 11 separate regions for each gene, and we collapse those together into one. And then we go the standard statistics clustering integration type analyses. The probe set annotation. Well... Arrays can become outdated. Perhaps the most important thing to think about in a micro experiment relative to an RNA seq. In an RNA seq, you find whatever the heck is there. It's the RNA. By contrast, in an array, you're measuring targeted aspects of the experiment. You're saying, I want to measure these 20,000 genes. If somebody discovers a new gene tomorrow, you didn't find it. Well, the most commonly used microarray is uh, Affymetrix HG 133A. That's the single best-selling array in the history of the world. Look on GEO or other da rig databases. There are hundreds of thousands of these. E133, does anybody know what that stands for? So it's for Unigene, and 133 is the build number. So that's the database that they use to design the array. So we're currently at Unigene uh, 240 or so. So in short, there's 110 different builds. They release on average 10. So the annotation used to build the most widely used array in the world is about 10 years. A lot has changed in 10 years. We've sequenced a lot of genomes. We've identified genes that aren't even genes. They're contaminants from bacteria or viruses in the initial sequencing of the human genome. We've closed gaps. We've discovered new genes. 
we found in many cases things that we thought was a single gene were actually two or three that we hadn't been able to accurately resolve. So as that happens, we have a better idea of what the is actually measuring. And if we use the annotations that were first developed 10 years ago, which is the default for most analyses, then we're going to compare the analysis platform. Instead, we can't change the array regularly because the mask design and production itself is very expensive. And we take advantage of the fact that for each individual gene, there will be on average 11 probes. So those 11 probes, some of them are actually going to be good, faithful representations of the gene. Some of them might just be noise. We might find, actually, that's not an exon, that's an intron, and it's never actually expressed. We made a mistake. Or this cross-hybridizes to 12 other genes in the genome. And so there's a great opportunity here to say, let's take those multiple regions per gene and map them and remap them. And so when you do an affymetrics experiment, you start off with a chip, which gets scanned to this DAT file. A DAT file is actually just a TIFF. I don't know why it's got a special fancy file extension, except they thought it would look good. But, uh, the, it gets scanned to a TIFF image, which then gets processed into your, quantitated into your, your raw data or your cell file. Cell stands for chip expression levels. This is kind of your input data to all analyses. There's a file called a CD. All the probes, both control and non-control, are related to genes. And all you have to do is update that. And groups around the world do that. Basically, they'll go ahead and realign all of the probes to new locations and update them. Using a proper CDF file is the single biggest identifier of an if array experiment was well analyzed. If I see an experiment under review, when I can analyze it using an alternative CDF, I go, oh boy, this is going to be a if they did, the odds are really good that they probably got it right. So it's a key character, key differentiating characteristic. All right. The last thing that we should talk about is going back to preprocessing. So what exactly is it? Well, preprocessing is the removing of sources of technical noise. Experiment. So for example, anything that comes from the initial manufacturer of the chip, batch effects, spatial effects in manufacturing. Anything that comes from which we actually process the samples or hybridize them to the array. And so, a list of things that can introduce technical artifacts, some of which you just go, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Um, for probably 10 years, we had systematic issues with microarrays run in the summer in Toronto. Because ozone levels rise in the summer and ozone quenches the dye that is being used for. And so during my PhD, we would find that between the months of May and August, we got no useful microarray hybridization, and it took us like a year and a half to figure out why all of our experiments suddenly stopped working. The only way to get it to work was for a postdoc to come in at 11 p.m. and run the experiments between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. That sounds crazy, but actually most stuff are run in ozone-free rooms now to avoid this kind of problem. Those sorts of systematic artifacts are everywhere in all sequencing and genomic experiments, and it's incredibly important to be able to remove those. That's the goal of pre-processing. But the pre-processing that we do, the normalization, is kind of a sledgehammer because we don't know exactly the contribution of each of these effects. So we apply broad statistical transforms that try to smooth out huge characteristics of the data, hoping to remove these sources of noise. And so pre-processing is necessary because we have all these sources of noise, but it's more important up front to try to minimize these. And so, I have a question actually at the brief as well. Um, Pre-processing is not the best way to remove all of these things. You want to remove them by good experimental design. If you design your experiments and minimize the noise, then you can do more gentle pre-processing and your data will be more clean. In an ideal world, we would not even have to pre-process. Everything would be perfect right off of the experiments and we wouldn't think about it. I'm not going to talk for hours about good experimental design. You probably know most of the principles and should think about them, but I'll point out a couple of key things. Number one, if you have to think about it, balance experimental groups. So if you have a choice of doing 20 samples, you should probably do 10 tumors and 10 normals. That'll give you your maximum statistical power, number one. And number two, it's very 
group of normals or a group of controls that you're going to use to identify the normal variation, normal experimental variation. Number two, you have to choose. choose to use biological replicates versus technical replicates. So if you can do 20 arrays, 10 individuals with cancer and 10 individuals without, not one individual with cancer 10 times and one individual without cancer. Time you do a biological replicate, you're simultaneously measuring biological noise and technical noise. That allows you to get combined estimates of both. By contrast, you if you take a single individual and do it only ten times, you'll have ten robust estimates of technical noise. Unfortunately, you'll have no assessment of biological uh, variability. And of course, in most of our experiments, biological variability is much larger than technical variability. Therefore, it's very important to be able to maximize how well we assess it. And maybe most important, you want to process your samples identically in every way, shape, or form. But that's not actually possible. So imagine I get a grant that gives me $200,000 to do my purpose. And I get $100,000 in year one and $100,000 in year two. So I'm going to process 1,000 samples a year. Well, I'm going to be very excited. So in year one, I'm going to go to the pull out a thousand samples and go, let's process these. Then I'm going to wait a year until my next batch of money comes process the next thousand. In the intervening 12 and 11 months, all sorts of things will change. The batches of reagents, the samples that get older, the technician might change. It's important that when that happens, you include controls. So for example, you would take a small set of samples, call it 20 samples, and I would do those same 20 samples in year one and year two. So instead of getting 2,000 samples, I get 1,980 samples. But now I have 20 estimates exactly of what changed from year one to year two. And I can use those to assess just how big are my batch effects and what kinds of batch effects do I have? Can I somehow mitigate or remove them? And in fact, you might even run those 20 samples first thing before you run your another 980 samples in year two to get your assessment of do we have any hints that there are large batch effects if they're really large maybe I should redesign my experiment or go back to genomics and figure out where they come from that kind of thing is incredibly common and we often do experiments we'll do five now and then we'll do 15 later and then oh next year we found another 10 we'll do those and that sounds like a nice way that we're just increasing the size of our experiment that's a very dangerous thing because, of course, as it grows, you're also going to be having different batches and different amounts of technical artifacts. And so it's important to think through in advance the types of controls that you're going to need. All right, lastly, before we get into the practical, there are two widely used... Sorry, let me stop there. Any questions? Yeah. If, you, if you run different batches at different times, and you Yeah, so it depends. Principal component analysis doesn't necessarily, so it depends on the experiment. Um, sometimes that's not the largest trend in the data set, and so it might not show up in PC1 or 2 or even 3, but it might still be a large factor. So you can imagine that um, PC1, 2, and 3 might comprise 80% of the variability, PC4 might be 10% of the analysis entirely, and you'd have a 10% noise. So um, I don't think that's a good way of assessing batch effects in general. It's a nice visualization and give some hints, but if you want to assess batch effects formally, you should have the same sample done multiple times and compare them directly, look at the fraction of genes that change, do statistics, and multiple testing adjustments. So there are two major ways of pre-processing affymetrics data, which you're about to do. They are called RMA for robust multi-array and MAS5 for microanalysis suite 5. Long time ago, like a decade ago, Affymetrics thought it was fun to develop their own algorithms and did, did a lot of work on it. They released an algorithm that's truly terrible called MAS4, and it was so bad that a bunch of statisticians said we can do better, and they created an algorithm called RMA. When Affymetrics realized that other people were going to do the hard work and money of developing algorithms for them, they basically stopped. So the statisticians who fixed it also had the consequence that the company doesn't really do it, and they routinely release products now with not Support available. The algorithms kind of trade off strengths and weaknesses. 
They're both very reasonable ways of analyzing microarray data. Um, in short, MAS5 is a more accurate algorithm. So it's able to come up with a better estimate of, for example, a fold change, but it is not as precise. There'll be a plus minus around it. RMA is less accurate. It tends to have bias and it particularly tends to underestimate true effects, but it is much more precise and therefore, you kind of think that if you have a large patient cohort with a lot of statistical power, MASS-5 is probably a better way to go. And if you've got a very small one, then RMA is probably a better way to go because it allows you to work in discovery mode. Both are well accepted by reviewers and journals, and neither will get you into anything that approximates trouble in the, the peer review process, as long as you do your QA, QC to see if these are, are appropriate algorithms for your own individual data set. So... Um, we're going to go through. The, well, I'm not going to take a break. We're going to walk through the use of the algorithms on a real data set. See what it looks like. Okay.